Good Friday, everybody. Got a uh, quick uh, statement, and then I'll get to your questions. I wanted to begin by drawing your attention to the uh, statement CENTCOM released a short time ago from General Votel concerning Turkey, and any suggestion General Votel supported the recent coup attempt uh, in that country. You have his statement refuting that, but I wanted to reiterate a few things from this podium, uh, if I could. The United States has repeatedly condemned the failed coup in Turkey, and we continue to convey our absolute support for Turkey's democratically elected civilian government and democratic institutions. Turkey is a close NATO ally and a vital member of the counter-ISIL coalition. The U.S. military has worked very closely with our Turkish allies for decades to counter a wide range of threats to our common security. At all levels of our military hierarchy, we are in regular communication with our Turkish counterparts. As General Votel said at the Aspen Security Forum on Thursday, Turkey has been an extraordinary and vital partner, and any reports that suggest General Votel expressed support in any fashion for the actions of Turkish military officers who undertook illegal military action against the Turkish government are factually inaccurate. Likewise, as Secretary Carter and Chairman Dunford have made clear previously, any suggestion anyone in the department supported the coup in any way would be absurd. We look forward to continuing our close cooperation with Turkey going forward. Separately, I also wanted to mention that CENTCOM announced yesterday that it has initiated an assessment to determine whether a U.S. airstrike conducted Thursday near Manbij, Syria, may have resulted in the unintentional deaths of civilians. That assessment is still in its early phase, and we do not have all the facts at this time and we do not have any conclusions. Again, this assessment was triggered by CENTCOM's own internal reporting, and that only highlights the seriousness with which our forces take the issue of civilian casualties and the obligation to protect innocent lives on the battlefield. The United States and our coalition partners have taken exceptional measures to minimize the risk to civilians in this conflict. And I think it's important to contrast the seriousness with which we treat these issues, the care we take to protect innocent lives, and our accountability and transparency with the enemy that we are fighting. ISIL has launched a series of attacks in Iraq and Syria in which civilian deaths were not an unintended consequence. Civilian deaths were the intent. ISIL has proudly claimed responsibility for attacks just this month that have killed hundreds of innocent civilians, including the July 4th attack in Baghdad that killed more than 140 people, and the bombing just this week in al Qamishli, Syria, that killed more than 40. And, of course, it has also claimed responsibility for terror attacks, horrific terror attacks, outside Iraq and Syria. We will continue to work hard every day to execute our mission while doing our best to minimize the risk to innocent civilians and to be transparent and accountable about those efforts. We do not expect ISIL to do the same. With that, I'm happy to take your questions. Lita. Um, just to further clarify on the Turkey thing, um, General Votel also made some specific comments about his concerns about the impact of the coup and said that he is concerned that um, the U.S. has had relationships with a lot of Turkish military leaders um, and that he's concerned that the coup might have an impact on that. Does the Secretary or does the Pentagon agree with that assessment that there are concerns about the impact of the coup on U.S. relations with the military there? Well, as I pointed out, we've had excellent military uh, relations with Turkey for decades, uh, and we continue to have excellent military relations with Turkey. Uh, I, what I think General Votel was referring to specifically is that we are engaged in active operations right now with Turkey. Certainly the counter-ISIL campaign is, a, is the, the best example of that at this moment. And uh, as I heard his comments yesterday at Aspen, he was referring to the fact that in some cases our counterparts um, may not be in those same positions at this time, and to ensure that we continue to operate uh, effectively with, uh, uh, with the Turkish military. Uh, he was addressing the concern that that continued, and he's talked about the excellent cooperation we've gotten the Turks and just making sure that that cooperation continues and that nothing affects our operations. So far, as he indicated again, our operations uh, at Incirlik are, uh, continue. And I think, uh, understandably, the CENTCOM commander who's responsible for those operations with regard to ISIL was expressing that concern to make sure that there's nothing, uh, that we don't miss a beat here. And I think that was what he was trying to convey. I mean, he specifically said, um, I'm concerned about what impact, it, what the impact is on most relationships as we continue to move, move, move forward. So are you saying the Secretary does or does not agree that there's a concern about the impact 
on the re military relationships? I think what we're, we're, the concern that General Votel expressed that I think is uh, fair to say that, that we all share is making sure that our operations against ISIL are not impacted. The Secretary has received assurances from his counterpart that that's not going to happen. As the operational commander responsible for CENTCOM, uh, and obviously uh, uh, with regard to the, the overall mission, uh, General Votel was expressing his concern that that not happen. The Secretary would share uh, that, uh, uh, that concern, but he's had assurances from his own counterpart that that's not going to happen, and, uh, and uh, that's certainly we would we want this operation to continue seamlessly, and I think that's what uh, General Votel was expressing as well. Uh, just one other uh, quick thing on that one, he, um, and then he also said that some of the people, some of the military officers that the U.S. has been dealing with are indeed in jail. Is that your understanding also? Uh, I'm going to leave it to the Turkish government. I do not know the disposition of everyone involved. And then he, he made one other comment that seemed to suggest that while power is back on, et cetera, at Insterlik, that there are some outstanding issues that continue to be at least somewhat um, problematic there. Can you talk about what may or what some of those may be? Um, I'll, I'll refer you back to, to CENTCOM and, and General Votel, but uh, obviously you know we had the concerns about the power situation at Inserlik. Uh We are up and running again, um, and at this point in time we want to make sure that nothing in our fight against ISIL is interrupted, that if anything we can accelerate that effort. Uh, whether it be from Turkey or from uh, with our, our partnership with other coalition partners. And I think that is the concern that General Votel was expressing. And uh, we have an opportunity here to, to truly accelerate this campaign. And uh, we want to follow through on that. We believe all the members of the coalition, including Turkey, would like to do the same thing. We all share a con common enemy in ISIL. Idris. Um, if I could move to Syria for, for just a minute. Two questions. Um, firstly, the Russian and Syrian governments announced yesterday this uh, sort of humanitarian operation in rebel-held parts of Aleppo, saying they wanted civilians to sort of be allowed safe passage. Um, firstly, was the Pentagon in coordination with the Russian, or were we coordinated with before the announcement was made? And secondly, do you think this is a sincere effort, or is this sort of a ruse, as some officials have called it, to get civilians out and then be able to strike um, those areas? Uh, again, we're not in uh, negotiations with the, the Russians. Uh, Secretary Kerry has been uh, negotiating, as you know, the State Department's been in the lead with regard to our conversations with the, with the Russians, so I'll leave it to the State Department to, to characterize those. I understand even Secretary Kerry was asked about this uh, today. So we did not have any coordination or, or understanding about uh, this corridor um, that's being discussed or by the Russians, so. Second thing, on, on the Manbij sort of assessment that you've started, this obviously isn't the first time mm -hmm. in this month that there's been an assessment. I mean, there are only U.S.-led coalition airplanes in that area, so it's very unlikely that it's anyone but a U.S.-led coalition partner. The opposition has called for strikes to stop. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, at what point do you say, okay, let's stop, let's look at what the problem is, and then you move forward? Because, I mean, obviously, I mean, the number is pretty enormous um, for these strikes to be taking place and for them to continue while the investigations continue. This is, uh, Idris, a, a critical part of the effort right now against ISIL. We've described how important Manbij is. We've described how complicated this situation is with regard to uh, the forces taking on ISIL, the urban environment that, uh, that this is in, the fact that ISIL has been dug in. ISIL has been willing to uh, uh, place itself uh, in and around civilians. Uh, this is a complicated uh, situation. And we will continue to apply the rigor uh, that we always do in terms of minimizing the risk to civilians. But we are supporting those forces because this is, as I said before, a critical moment in this campaign. This is a critical uh, piece of territory. This is a place where we uh, feel strongly that ISIL has planned external attacks outside of Syria. Uh, and that makes it all the more important why uh, those local forces that we're supporting uh, can capture this territory and, and remove ISIL from this area. And that requires uh, uh, air support by the coalition that we'll continue to provide. But obviously this is a situation, this most recent one, there have been, uh, there's at least one other strike in which, again, a credibility assessment has already been conducted and determined to be credible, um, that we're going to apply the rigor 
uh, and the diligence needed to find out exactly what happened here uh, and uh, take whatever lessons we learn from that and apply that to our uh, how we conduct our missions. But this is a difficult environment. I uh, would be uh, clear about the, the urban environment here and, and the complicating factor about the enemy we're targeting, what they're doing uh, with regard to the civilians around them. They are not taking steps to protect civ innocent civilian life. It doesn't seem to be working because why not get the assessments complete, learn from them, and then make those changes and continue? Because, I mean, obviously, if people are dying on the ground, they're not going to be in support of U.S.-led coalition strikes. I mean, it's not winning hearts and minds if, you know, you've sort of used strategies in the past. I mean, it just doesn't seem if, like a smart idea to continue striking even those civilians. Well, those, those local forces we're supporting might have a different view if we weren't conducting those uh, airstrikes in their, in their support. Uh, um, I imagine you'd be asking me some of the same questions if those forces came under attack from ISIL because we weren't providing some of the air support to them. So we are using, uh, again, coalition is using the uh, a very careful scrutiny in how we conduct these operations. We will continue to review uh, these particular instances in which there is uh, at least uh, uh, claims of, of civilian casualties being present. If that were the case, how did that happen? Uh, what in our operational system needs to be uh, reviewed and looked at. But we will continue to, to take this fight to ISIL and to apply the rigor to these airstrikes um, that we have from the start of this campaign. Remember, we've had uh, thousands of airstrikes at this point. Um, we have taken every possible step we can to try and reduce the risk of civilian casualties, and we believe uh, that track record uh, is, is an excellent track record and that we have taken many instances in which we have not carried out strikes because of that risk. Uh, and we'll continue to do so. Yes, Christina. Uh, thanks, Peter. Um, Jabhat al-Nusra has now uh, detached from um, al-Qaeda, and they've rebranded themselves uh, Jabhat Fatah al-Sham or some, 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 something like that. Uh, will the DOD continue strike this new group, and does that change whether, you know, the DOD's calculation of whether it will continue, or does there need to be a State Department designation, or? Um, the just because they change their name doesn't mean they've changed their, their actions. And this will continue to be a group that, uh, um, that we'll continue to focus our, our efforts on for the understandable reason that this is a terrorist group that has uh, in the past and continues to threaten U.S., uh, the United States, American citizens, and, and our interests. Uh, and so a name change alone, it's, it's actions, not names and words, uh, that we'll be watching going forward. This group, whatever they're called, it <laughs> remains uh, again a, a terrorist target, uh, as it has been for some time. A yes. couple of clarifiers: um, the assessment that you opened with—that's for the July 23rd strike. There hasn't been a third uh, civilian casualty incident. Um, I'm referring to uh, incident that CENTCOM uh, issued a statement last night regarding an airstrike. Uh, in and around Manbij that occurred yesterday. So there is a third incident then? Yes, this is a, a, a third incident with regard to the, the previous ones that they've discussed. This is a third incident that took place yesterday. Okay, um, and then shifting to Turkey, there was a protest outside in Sirlik. Um Could you give us an update on, for the U.S. personnel that are inside the base, do they have any ability to move within or out of Incirlik, and what sort of force posture measures are being taken to protect the personnel at the base? Well, you know, you know, I'm not going to get into all the uh, force posture, all the security precautions that we have in place for our forces, but uh, we've been at an elevated uh, force protection level at Incirlik uh, for some time. Uh, we'll continue to take every step we need to to make sure our personnel uh, and other uh, coalition personnel are as safe as possible at that uh, at, at Incirlik. It remains uh, a foremost concern, a uh, foremost uh, priority for us, and uh, will continue to be so. But our operations continue. So can they move in and out of the base right now, or are they uh, all stuck on the base? I'm, I'm not going to get into all the security precautions in place right now with our personnel. Okay, and then last, um, this morning the Marines put out a statement about an F-A-18 crash in California. Uh, there are reports that it occurred during a combat simulation known as air assault course. Can you confirm those reports? I'm going to refer you back to the Marines. Uh, understand that tragedy took place here and uh, the Marines will have the best information in terms of what took place 
uh, and the investigation surrounding it. Andrew. Peter, um, in, in Iraq, um, the uh, Shiite cleric Muqtad al-Sadr seems to have uh, been taking a very different uh, tone in his public remarks lately. It's, he's made some specific threats to uh, the U.S. troops in particular since the secretary announced the uh, additional forces that will deploy there. Um, is that a concern? Is the secretary concerned at all that, uh, that Sadr, who has a long history of um, being confrontational with American forces over there, could uh, pose a, a problem for the counter ISIL campaign? Obviously, Andrew, anyone, anytime we have people threatening U.S. forces, that's a concern. But we feel confident in the security measures that we've put in place, the protective measures, uh, as well as our relationship with the government of Iraq and Prime Minister Abadi uh, with regard to, to our cooperation with the, those, uh, the Iraqi forces right now. We're working together to defeat ISIL, uh, the common enemy of ISIL, and, uh, and Again, uh, we'll continue to work closely with the government of Iraq and seek their help in making sure uh, any issues about force protection for our personnel are addressed. Yes, Paul. Um, can I just ask when we should expect to see results of the civilian casualty assessments in both the um, 19th case and the 23rd? Um, I would imagine that the credibility assessments, uh, they generally take um, a matter of days. Um, I'll leave it to CENTCOM to give you the specifics, but I think in a short amount of time we'll have a, a sense of the credibility assessment uh, in these cases as to. The credibility assessment for the one. The first one's been. been done. Yeah, so um, I'll leave it to CENTCOM to, to walk you through the, the timetable, but uh, the actual formal investigation um, I know will be conducted as quickly as possible, but they will want to get as many facts as they can from as many sources as they can uh, beyond just uh, our own internal. Uh, operational uh, resources. So, uh, but I'll leave it to CENTCOM to give you a better sense of the actual timeline. I just also wanted to ask about the numbers. So, I think the number of affirmed civilian casualties, uh, all told, uh, from the coalition and the campaign is something around 55. And each of these instance, in incidents around Manbij are one of those incidents would, if, if we believe the numbers that are coming out of Syria, would be higher than all, all the deaths that have been reported by the coalition for the last two years. And as you said yourself, there are more than a thousand airstrikes that have been conducted. So, what's? Uh, are you confident that the reporting structure that is in place at CENTCOM is capturing all of the civilian casualties potentially being caused by these airstrikes? I'm confident that the uh, structure that we have in place um, is a rigorous and thorough means by which of determining uh, those instances in which allegations of civilian casualties um, can be deemed credible or not. Uh, we, the rigor that uh, our forces apply to this, again, both in the original targeting and in the assessment afterwards, when there are allegations, is extremely uh, strict and rigorous and will continue to be so. And uh, uh, the number you provided, uh, the 55 numbers, the same number I understand that we have at this point. Um, obviously, we regret any loss of, of innocent life in this conflict. And we'll continue everything we can to to minimize it, and these instances in which there are uh, uh, reports of civilian casualties in and around Manbij will be uh, properly scrutinized. And that is, I think you heard from the Secretary and, and General Votel at the counter ISIL meeting the other day. Uh, that's a reflection of how we conduct ourselves in, these, in this conflict. It is a reflection of our values uh, and uh, the respect we have for uh, civilians in these conflict zones and the steps that we're trying to take to minimize that. And uh, in those instances in which there are civilian casualties, we will be as transparent as we can be about how this happened and try and learn whatever lessons we can at the same time. And just lastly, in the interest of transparency, why are the dismissed allegations of civilian casualties not being released by SEC? Uh, in terms of credibility assessments that... Uh, so is releasing instances where the U.S. has confirmed uh, that there have been civilian, civilian casualties, but all of the other reports of allegations of civilian casualties, which CENTCOM is going through its process and then dismissing, are not being released. Why? Because someone at sent the, the process involved has uh, looked at this to determine whether there is credible uh, evidence to suggest that there were civilian casualties and that that process has concluded that there uh, was not a credible allegation. And How can we evaluate that process if we don't know what the allegation was and on what basis it was dismissed? 
Um, I'll, I'll refer you to, to Sancom if there's particular instances in which you uh, have questions. Um, but we have tried to address the ones that were brought to our attention, and uh, CENTCOM has a strict process for this. Uh, the U.S. military has a very strict process for this, and we are trying to respond to the instances in which there are credible allegations, and we go through a process, a, a, a very strict process in trying to determine what that is. That includes, as I mentioned before, not just our own operational uh, evidence, but things that might be collected outside, social media, uh, videos, uh, personal accounts. Um, this is a, a conflict zone right now. And our ability to col collect information in each and every one of these instances, um, given the limits in terms of American personnel on the ground, are, are not insignificant in some circumstances. So that is also a factor we have to weigh in, in determining these credibility assessments. But I'd like to follow up on that, if I may, and a couple of other things as well. Um, it's not just the ones that you um, deem not credible, but the ones where you are able to come to no conclusion, perhaps, because of all the factors you've raised. Mm -hmm. And this is a policy matter. This is, um, I'm assuming, that Central Command obeys whatever DOD policy is. The Secretary comes up and talks about this all the time on civilian casualties. So can we circle back with you right now and ask you to take the question, how many in addition to the 55, how many other cases, how many other people, human beings, comparing apples and apples here on 55, how many others have you looked at and you deem not credible? How many others have you looked at and you simply can come to no conclusion? Could you try and get us an answer to that? Because that's a department-wide question. So anything you could do to throw your weight behind that and get us an answer. We, we will continue, Barbara, to be as transparent as we can be about these. About That's these, yeah, uh, we'll, we'll continue to, to try and do that and try and respond as, as clearly as we can. And uh, we provided specific numbers in these instances. CENTCOM continues to do that. If you have particular instances, it'd be, it'd be helpful for us to be able to respond to specific cases. I want, I personally, as a reporter, I'd like to see the overall numbers. I cannot give you time, date, and place because I don't know what else they've looked into. So for, on the basis of public transparency, can you get a total number for us, what they had, how many people, civilians, you deem the allegation of a civilian casualty not credible? How many people, civilians, have you not been able to come to a conclusion about one way or the other because perhaps of lack of, of information and data? I don't know. I have no way of, we, we have no way of knowing what they are. We'd like to know, we're asking you guys, what are those two sets of numbers? Uh, I'll take your question, Barbara, and again, uh, I will stand by the process that CENTCOM and, and uh, and this institution has have had in place for some time in terms of the rigor uh, and the numbers that we're providing right now. And uh, if there's more transparency that we can provide, we certainly right. will try and provide it. What we're looking for is the other two-thirds of the equation here beyond the 55 that they're willing, they are able to acknowledge. So anything you could do to get that additional transparency. Understood. My other two questions very quickly are, General Votel yesterday, what, what he was said, and Lita pointed this out, is that he had some concerns. So is in fact, is in fact, are U.S. military operations against ISIS out of Turkish bases 100 percent back to pre-coup operations, activities? Is there any area in Turkey where you are not back to where you were before the coup? Uh, I think, as General Votel indicated yesterday, Incirlik is back up and, and running. Our cooperation with the Turks remains excellent, and we continue our operations. As we've heard from the Turkish uh, Minister of Defense, the Secretary himself, their cooperation going forward in this campaign remains intact. We are the only concern I think that uh, General Votel was expressing was concern that there would be some sort of interruption going forward that we certainly don't anticipate or expect, um, but we are in a very uh, complicated uh, environment right now where we want to apply as much pressure on ISIL as possible, and whether it's in Turkey or elsewhere, 
We don't want any interruption going forward. I think that's the concern that he was expressing. Is it, what is the interruption going forward that worries you? There, we had an interruption at Interlick for a few days, as you know. Uh, we don't have any indication of problems at this moment in time, and we would just like to maintain that. And that was, I think, what uh, General Votel was expressing yesterday at, at Aspen. And as he said publicly at Aspen, we've had excellent cooperation from the Turks. We want to make sure that continues, um, and we have every reason to believe it will based on the conversations we're having with the Turks. Okay, can I just clarify on Barbara's point? He was asked very specifically, are you talking about potential future concerns or already existing concerns? And he very specifically said his current existing concerns are about the impact on the relationship. That currently, right now, he is concerned that the coup is impacting U.S. military. He said relations, and then further clarified, military with U.S. Turkish military relations. I, that he was afraid of that impact. I, I think, as I think, if you heard what he had to say, he ex expressed his concerns about the fact that, in some cases, U.S. Uh, military counterparts are not necessarily there to have the same correspondence that they did before the coup. Right. He said uh, he's, I, I leave, he did refer uh, at one point to that. But I think the larger point here is that we have excellent military military uh, cooperation, have had for some time with the uh, Turkish military. So if, if you are no longer able to talk to a, a counterpart that you've dealt with for some time, um, there's a concern that there might be some breakdown in communication. We are trying to work through that with uh, the Turks and have every confidence we'll be able to do that. I think that's what General Votel was speaking to. So confidence to be able to do that. You're suggesting with those word choices there is a situation right now and confidence to be able to do that is in the future. So the bottom line is there are Turkish military personnel in jail in Turkey as a result of the coup that you were dealing with that you can no longer deal with and you're rebuilding that relationship. Is that accurate? Uh, I'm not going to characterize what uh, the disposition of all those people but I think it is, as the Turkish government has made clear, there are changes within the Turkish military, and we are, uh, in some cases, and it's not just the United States, but other countries that may have had military-to-military -military relations with the Turks, now may be dealing with uh, new individuals. And we'll work through that, and that's what we're doing. And I think that's uh, our military communications with the Turks will continue uh, as they work through these issues themselves. These are domestic issues for the Turkish government, for the sovereign Turkish government, and we will continue to work through that. We happen to be involved uh, in a, a campaign right now against ISIL with Turkey and other coalition countries in which we do not want to see that campaign miss a beat. And we are going to work as diligently as we can to make sure that doesn't happen. Let me move over. Goyal. Thanks, sir. Two questions. One, uh, common enemy ISIL. They are killing uh, thousands of innocent people and also spreading uh, into Europe and also in Asia, uh, including in the uh, South Asia region. And now, at the State Department, more than 20 nations are meeting religious and ethnic minorities under ISIL, including uh, India and U.S. counterterrorism. So what role do you think Pentagon is playing at this uh, meeting at the State Department against ISIL? Well, we obviously had a significant meeting at the State Department last week in which we had both the defense ministers and the foreign ministers of all the coalition countries uh, engaged in the fight against ISIL. As the secretary has said uh, for some time, there's a military component to this campaign, but there is certainly uh, that is not sufficient in and of itself to deal with the threat posed by ISIL. There are efforts uh, that we need to, in terms of both political and stabilization, economic efforts that need to be uh, uh, need to be conducted in order to make sure that ISIL is defeated and stays defeated. Uh, and there are other efforts to reach out um, around the world to try and address uh, questions about this uh, hateful ideology and what can be done in terms of uh, uh, making clear uh, that ISIL is, uh, is a threat just in terms of its, uh, the message it's sending around the world. So these are all things that, that I'm sure my colleagues at the State Department are engaged with there. We're focused here on the military campaign and, and very focused on it. Who's training them and uh, arming them, supplying arms? It takes uh, training and arms uh, uh, to kill innocent people. Are you tackling them? Who's behind these we, two? It's part of our overall campaign. We're going after not only uh, their weapons caches, uh, those weapons that in many cases they've been able to recover within 
Syria and, and Iraq from uh, territory that they've, uh, that they've taken. Uh, we're going after their finances. We're going after their oil assets. We're going after their ability to, to tax people. Um, we're approaching it from each and every front, including the weapons that they're maintaining. And finally, sir, on uh, South China Sea, how dangerous is the situation now? China and Russia is now have moved and they are exercising, and also China is threatening those nations in the region after this uh, Hague uh, outcome. Um, so uh, some, this may be uh, leading to a third world war because if China continues its behavior the way it is going on, some uh, things are saying in Washington. Well, we certainly, that's not something we're, uh, there's uh, plenty of reasons to, to believe that, that tensions over the South China Sea in light of this uh, ruling that there's an opportunity for all the countries in that part of the world uh, to resolve their differences there peacefully. That has been certainly our goal. Um, a diplomatic resolution um, is the most appropriate way to resolve these issues. We don't uh, take any particular stand on the claims here, as you know, uh, but we do encourage peaceful resolution. Uh, this particular ruling presents an opportunity for countries uh, to pursue those kinds of avenues of resolution. Uh, and if anything, this should be an opportunity to reduce the ten very tensions you talked about. Yes, Pasi. Peter, the presidents, I, I will go back to Turkey, by the way, President Obama and President sure, Erdogan, sure. <laughs> and also uh, defense chiefs and also top commanders talked to each other and assured each other that the cooperation between the two countries mm -hmm. are going to excellently continue. Yeah. But why is that concern within the military, the United States, the U.S. military, that the change of some people on the ground would affect the relationship between the two militaries? Uh, I think what General Votel has expressed, what you've heard from Chairman Dunford and Secretary Carter, is that we, we don't expect that it's going to have uh, an impact on the relationship, and we certainly don't want it to. I think what we heard from General Votel is that uh, the relationship is so extensive, our military-to-military -military relationship built up over years as a NATO ally, um, and that there's significant interaction that's been taking place over the years at lower levels than the highest levels of the military. And uh, uh, the only concern being expressed is that uh, in some instances, a counterpart may not be there who you worked with directly. Now you need to find out who that new person might be. I think it's just the operational flow of, of that engagement um, that we want to make sure doesn't miss a beat. And I think that's the only thing that, that was expressed. The, the, those who have been removed mm -hmm. are also replaced at the same time. Yes. So, so yes. it just takes in not even one day that you will have another individual on the ground. And, and the procedures are clear. So why is the, this concern among the... I think you just explained what we, what we hope happens in this instance. Uh, I think that's what General Votel was expressing. Uh, professional military relations between our two countries have been excellent. We want to maintain, make sure that they continue that way. And you've heard that, as you said, from the highest levels of... Uh, of the Turkish uh, military and from the highest levels of the U.S. military. That's our goal. That's, this is an important NATO ally, important uh, vital partner in the fight against ISIL, and we don't want to see anything that, uh, that might interrupt that, and, and we have no expectation that there, that there will, um, especially in light of the comments of support uh, uh, from both uh, folks in, uh, in positions of power in Turkey and, of course, uh, the senior leadership here. And then just one last question. You know, there have been a lot of claims, <clears throat> both against General Votel now, against uh, General Campbell before, and also um, Director, uh, CIA Director Klepper also had some comments which raised a lot of discussions in Turkey. Could you assure the Turkish public opinion that none of those plotters had good relations with the United States? I can assure you that, uh, as I said at the beginning here, any suggestion that any member of the Department of Defense uh, supported or played a role in the uh, attempted coup in Turkey, that that is, would be absurd to suggest that. You've heard that from Chairman Dunford. You've heard that from Secretary Carter. Uh, it is almost laughable. Uh, and, uh, and so it, it would be a concern if that uh, suggestion uh, is being portrayed uh, out there, because it does not reflect the professional uh, military relationship between uh, our two countries. No relation with the U.S. military at all. Good relations. 
we have had excellent relations with the Turkish military. Um, and what I'm saying is the suggestion that anyone in the Department of Defense, any of the uh, uniform uh, officials you just uh, referred to, uh, had any role or had any support for what took place in Turkey would be wrong. Uh, and we have condemned the coup. We have uh, supported the democratically elected government of Turkey and will continue to do so. And we'll continue to maintain the excellent military to military, the defense relationship uh, with Turkey. Yes, Jenny. Thank you, Peter. Um, Secretary of Army Fanning will visit to South Korea early next month. Do you know what purpose of his visit to South Korea for next month? I, I know that uh, Secretary Fanning is uh, making a trip through through Asia and has uh, several stops, but I'll refer you to his office and the, the Army for his itinerary. He will, when he visits South Korea, then uh, he will visit site of the whether Saad. I'll, I'll, I'll leave it to, uh, to Secretary Fanning and, and the Army to tell you his exact schedule. I honestly don't have it in front of me. Does the United States have an uh, uh, additional uh, plan for the deployment of Saad in South Korea? You have an additional deployment. Uh, I mean, you mean a second site? Yeah. Um, I, as we've discussed, uh, the THAAD deployment, um, the alliance decision to move forward with THAAD, um, at this point we're working through the issues with regard to this, uh, this deployment and uh, we're focused on that at this point. Okay. Andrew, sorry. Whoa. My, my fault. I saw Andrew here. Uh, is, um, is the U.S. flying strike missions out of Incirlik currently? Yes. Go ongoing. Yes. Okay. Now, based off of what's been said lately, mm -hmm. um, the, General Votel is, is the second commander to be brought into this. Does the U.S. have contingency plans if um, Insulik is cut off? Um, we, as we've said, even when we were not able to fly missions, we're able to mitigate uh, and and deal with. Uh, uh, instances in which we're unable to fly from certain locations. We have the ability to adjust uh, and accommodate that, but uh, Incirlik's a, a critical location and and we would, the coalition would prefer to fly from, from Incirlik for a variety of reasons uh, and we think it's an important uh, capability and, and uh, greatly appreciate uh, Turkey allowing those missions to fly from, from Incirlik. But we do have the ability to adjust. As you know, uh, previously we did not have access to Incirlik and we uh, conducted missions. But uh, we anticipate being able to fly from Incirlik and we're doing so right now, successfully. Can I follow on that? Yes. So yesterday there were some protests just outside of Incirlik Turks who were saying that they didn't want the U.S. presence there anymore and they didn't want the U.S. to be able to conduct strike missions. They showed up. They held up really graphic photos of people who've been killed by airstrikes in mm -hmm. Syria, I think it was, but maybe Iraq and Syria, I don't know. Um, is there any concern on the from the Department of Defense that the U.S. access to Incirlik will be cut off in the near future, not just because of what's happened in the political insta instability, but because of a lack of public Turkish support for the U.S. role there? As the Secretary has detailed, he had a good conversation with his Turkish counterpart in which um, they both agreed on the need to maintain the fight against uh, ISIL and our continued cooperation on that. Incirlik is a key part of that. We have no indication uh, of anything other than uh, Turkish cooperation with continuing those missions from Incirlik, and we're doing so, as I just said to Bill, uh, even today. So the Turks have not approached the, the U.S. about any change in the U.S. access or role or abilities of uh, any kind of um, parameters of what the U.S. military can and cannot do out of Incirlik in, in we are, recent days? We are flying missions as we were before, and again, we're appreciative. Uh, to the Turkish government's help in, in restoring the power and getting those flights back up and running, and they are flying as we speak. I have another random one, up, though, unless someone has another Turkey one. Well, that, was just, that wasn't her question. Her question was, had they communicated with the U.S. government or the Defense Department about the modifying that? The communication, again, that the Secretary of Defense received from his counterpart is our cooperation, our efforts focused on ISIL will continue, and that includes Insula. I have a Cambridge question. Oh, Let me, hold on. Has there been another call since the July 19th call between uh, Secretary Carter and his counterpart? Um, 
I'm not aware of a direct call between the secretary and uh, and his counterpart. I know that there have been other uh, communications with the Turkish military at other levels. I have another random one then. Uh, Let Chelsea, okay, Chelsea Manning is saying that uh, he, he called his attorneys and said that he's now being considered, I'm sorry, I apologize, she is now being considered for um, the potential for indefinite solitary confinement because of her suicide attempt earlier this month. Um, it, what's the department, I guess can you, can you run us through uh, if someone, if, if a, a prisoner in a U.S. military facility, I know it's an Army facility, but in a U.S. military facility, if a prisoner attempts suicide with some sort of an illicit item, with an illegal item that they're not supposed to have, is the common practice to then, um, to, for the punishment to be solitary confinement? Are you aware of that, and are you aware of the specific case, these allegations that she's made through her attorneys? Uh, I'm not aware, and I, I don't, quite honestly from here, know the exact protocol in those instances, so I'd refer you back to the Army, first of all. Um, but I'm happy to take the question, but I think the Army is probably your best bet for this specific case. So, give, I mean, just given the high-profile nature of this case, though, is that something that, um, is that something that the department, that the, the larger DOD might get involved in, if that, if an allegation like that, that specifically that her, she is alleging through her attorneys that she's being targeted because of her sexuality and because of the nature of her crimes and being treated differently and that with this um, suicide attempt, they've, they've you know, acknowledged that it was a suicide attempt several weeks ago, that because of that she's being treated differently. Is that something that DOD might, would get involved in that specific allegation, even though it's an Army facility? Um, I, I'm not aware of any DOD involvement in this case. Uh, like I said, I'm not tracking the specific uh, suggestion of the a claim from from uh, the individual. So I, I'm going to refer you to the Army because I, I don't have a solid answer for you on it because I don't know the specifics here, but I am sure that what you're going to hear from the Army uh, will be the details about how they handle these uh, cases in terms of people who are incarcerated. And, uh, and But I'll leave it to them to refer you to the actual protocols they follow. So, yes, Carla. Thank you. On Mandage, um considering how important it is for the United States to not kill or wound innocent civilians and considering how important Mandage is to the anti-ISIL coalition. Is there concern here at the Pentagon with the Syrian Arab coalitions calling in of strikes? Have there been any measures to retrain or kind of double down on the efforts on how they would conduct a strike and how they, they look into civilians in the area? Uh, I, Carla, as I think I pointed out before, every time we conduct a strike, we're looking at the individual circumstances of each strike, first of all, and the targeting to begin with, uh, and each one of those strikes afterwards is assessed. Certainly, in instances in which there uh, are credible claims of civilian casualties, we'll go through uh, and carefully examine exactly what took place there to see if there are lessons learned on uh, that can be applied to, to future missions. But uh, at, at this point, again, we're still getting the facts on these individual uh, uh, cases, these allegations, and uh, and we'll work through those, and we will, as we have in the past, apply that uh, knowledge to what we're doing going forward. Um, we expect this air campaign will continue to be a critical part of our effort against ISIL, not just in Manbij but elsewhere, and we will take those lessons learned uh, as appropriate. But are there any immediate lessons learned while while the evaluation process is underway? When we continue with each and every one of these strikes. We're looking at. Uh, the circumstances on the ground at that particular moment in time, uh, applying our normal set of tests, and if there are additional tests that need to be applied in light of what's happening, these credibility assessments will inform us of that. But those are ongoing. So, yes, are Richard. Any, uh, any change to the uh, status of the dependents in uh, Turkey? Any plans to move them out? Is voluntary evacuation still available to them? Well, you know, we had an order of departure in Turkey, so those dependents have already left uh, in at Interlik. We, we were told there's still about 100 left. Yeah. Um, uh, I'll check and see if there's been any change in their status. I'm not aware of any at, at this point, um, but the vast majority of dependents have already left Turkey as a result of those uh, those steps taken some time ago. But I'll take the question and find out. You don't think that there's 100 dependents still there? No, I, my, that was my understanding as of uh, last week. So I'm not sure if there's anything that's happened in the interim period. Uh, just, uh, I'm, I'm not clear on the connection uh, of the secretary with uh, 
Minister Isik of Turkey. Mm -hmm. uh, the only contact they've had uh, was on July 19th. They had a phone call. I don't even know the date uh, off the top of my head. They met uh, shortly before that in person. And the secretary, considering what's happened since, is the secretary trying to get a hold of him right now? Uh, the secretary, as I said, has an excellent relationship with the Minister of Defense uh, in Turkey. Uh, they had an excellent conversation on the phone, an extensive conversation to discuss uh, some of these issues. Some of the issues they discussed have been resolved, including the situation at Incirlik, and we continue to have excellent military, uh, excellent defense relationship with uh, Turkey at uh, various levels, and we'll continue to do so, uh, and uh, in part because we are engaged in this campaign with them against ISIL. We are talking with them on a, not just a daily basis, every single day at various levels uh, to make sure that we are uh, conducting this uh, this campaign as effectively as possible. We are also a NATO ally. I have those contacts on a daily basis as well. But there has been no contact between the Secretary and Minister Isik since July uh, 19th, since that phone conversation. I don't have any conversations to read out to you at this time. So. Just to follow up, I think yeah. the heart of the question, though, is with the accusations that are being levied against some of the top U.S. commanders, we're trying to figure out at what level communications are occurring between the government and military of Turkey and the U.S. And government and U.S. military, given the importance there have been of sub substantial conversations. But at what level and between who? Uh, I'm, uh, I've described to you the, the secretary's remarks. I know that uh, the chairman has had regular contact uh, with his counterpart. Um, I'll leave it to the chairman's office to describe those. But uh, these conversations continue at the highest levels. I think General Votel uh, referred to uh, to his conversations. Uh, in addition, so. This is an important relationship. We're going to continue to have these conversations and uh, and work through these issues. Well, so. do you know, Peter, if anyone's had discussions like today to help clarify or clear up some of the apparent misconceptions with what General Votel and or um, everyone said? Uh, General was Votel has issued, issued his own statement to right, make clear uh, some of the uh, suggestions that came from, from his comments that were uh, I think, uh, to General Votel's take, uh, misreported uh, or certainly misunderstood, and I think he wanted to, cl to make that clear. Right, but uh, and there's, there's something other than a press release. Has there been like a, do you know of, of we, any conversations like today? I, I'm, I can't read out each and every one, but I, I can assure you that even today there have been contacts at the highest levels of the U.S. military um, with uh, Turkish counterparts, and there, and there were yesterday, and there will be uh, going forward, um, whether it's uh, as part of NATO, as part of the counter-ISIL coalition, we'll continue to have those conversations with the, with, uh, the Turkish, our Turkish counterparts um, as appropriate. I know you don't speak for the State Department, but are you aware of any... Absolutely. <laughs> are you aware of any U.S. government um, re you know, uh, department reaching out or, or uh, representative reaching out to, to address these misconceptions that General Votels was citing with the coup plotters? Um, we're trying to make his clear as possible from here. Um, you've heard earlier this week on Monday, the chairman and the secretary talk about these issues when reference to uh, these uh, absurd allegations or suggestions that General Campbell played some role. Uh, I think we're being as clear as we can be about uh, the Department of Defense and the top leadership here and our views on some of the suggestions that have been uh, laid out there that somehow uh, the Department of Defense or people within the Department of Defense knew something or supported in any way this coup. That is uh, factually inaccurate. Uh, and with regard to, to others, we have, I'll leave it to the State Department to characterize their uh, conversations, but uh, uh, so I'll leave it to the State Department to speak for itself. Uh, but I think our leadership here has been clear on this point, and uh, I think General Votel has only emphasized that again today. This continues to have legs, and it is that while the DOD is speak, is putting out these statements and whatnot, the Turks don't seem to be disavowing these claims. So, is there any effort to work with these close partners you've said over and over you have such a close relationship with, and encourage them to to come out and disavow the claims that very senior four-star U.S. military leaders and the head of all the, in national intelligence in the U.S. were not behind the, the plot? And, and why? And what? Is, and why is it? Why are the Turks not coming out? And and saying that the U.S. didn't have a role behind this. Uh, I, I will leave it to the Turks to, to speak for themselves. We will continue to, uh, as best we can, 
make clear to, to uh, the Turkish people and to anyone who cares to listen um, that, again, our relationship with uh, Turkey remains uh, a solid defense relationship. We look forward to continued cooperation with this vital key NATO ally going forward. And, uh, and we will make it clear, um, based on the facts, of the appropriate relationship that we have with the Turkish military and how that will continue. Uh, again, I'll leave it to the Turks to characterize uh, what's going on um, for, for themselves. But I think individuals here, including General Votel, um, who have uh, had others suggest um, words that they did not say, um, will continue to say uh, clearly how important this relationship is and how uh, we'll continue to have those conversations to try and clear up any uh, misperceptions that may be out there. Can you take the question and maybe get back to us on any specific calls or conversations that anyone either within the Pentagon or in the U.S. military had with the Turks today, other than, I mean, I, I don't think we can assume that the Turkish people are reading General Votel's press statement. So, I mean, any sort of specific... We're counting on you all to spread that word. <laughs> I'm looking at Kasim right here. I'm hoping that he I mean, reports a few things from this news conference. I'm assuming you all don't rely on speaking through the media to another country. No, we absolutely so, don't. And I, uh, so you maybe I will, just get back to us and say... What sure. specific conversations anyone um, at a high level has had in the wake of these recent I will, allegations? I, let me, I want to make absolutely clear, though, Lita, that these conversations, separate and apart from today, happened yesterday, that whether it's our folks at UCOM who talk every day, in some cases, with their Turkish counterparts, this is a relationship that is so longstanding, so uh, normal in its exchange of information and uh, General Votel talked about the exchange of information, the integration that we have in terms of our operations with the Turks. Uh, we can't fly out of uh, Interlik with, of, of course, without the active participation of, of the Turkish military. We're doing that every day and at the highest levels um, we have continued conversations with them. I will uh, see if there's, a, if there's something we can get for you that, that highlights that, but what I'm, my point is is that that's not unusual. That happens all the time and will continue to happen. How, how helpful is it to this long-standing military relationship when the president of that country is saying to a U.S. general, know your place, you are taking the side of coup plotters, if the translation with BBC is, is accurate? How helpful is that? We had, General Votel has, has spoken to this himself uh, today uh, to make clear that, uh, uh, that any suggestion that he supported in any way what took place there would be factually inaccurate. And I think uh, we're trying to do, make that as abundantly clear as we can uh, and to be as constructive as we can in terms of making sure that our defense relationship there, that, uh, that there are no questions about the, the solid, the importance of that relationship and the need for continued cooperation, and which we expect and hope to see for decades more to come. And this is critically important right now because of the counter ISIL campaign, and of course, uh, uh, both being longstanding NATO allies. I know you have you have one more question, then I got to go. I just want to follow up on Courtney's question. Would sure. you like to see Turkish officials disavow th this idea that the U.S. was involved in the coup? Because the reason this has legs is because, as, as Courtney said, is because every time the suggestion comes up. It is not being denied on, on the part of Turkish officials. We will, like let, we will let the facts speak for themselves, and I'll let the Turkish government, the Turkish officials, speak for themselves. We, Secretary just had, uh, as I said, an excellent conversation with his Turkish counterpart. He has a great relationship with him. Uh, we're confident that the relationship between the United States and Turkey, the defense relationship, will continue uh, and will uh, will not be in any way impacted by this. Um, we will let the facts speak for themselves. We will let General Votel and others make clear if there are any misperceptions about, um, about uh, our views on this. Uh, we're trying to be as crystal clear as we can. Um, we want to continue our, the, the military business that we've conducted for decades uh, with the Turks, and we have every expectation we'll continue to do so. Can I just one clarification? When you're talking about all these calls that have been going back and forth, the many, 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 many calls you guys have mm -hmm. back and forth with the Turks, you're not saying that one or any of those calls dealt specifically with General Votel and his and and this alleged him being involved in the coup, right? Or, that was not your insinuation by that, right? Uh, we have. Uh, 
conversations every day with the Turks. Which but but since I, I think it is fair to say that since uh, the coup attempt, of course, there have been conversations at the highest levels of the U.S. military with the Turkish military. And uh, in addition, not just us, of course, President Obama spoke with uh, President Erdogan. But again, specifically about General Votel and any allegations that he might have been specifically involved. That's that because I just want to be clear when because Lita, since Lita asked you to take the question to come back, mm -hmm. if if you come back to us and say there were calls, blah blah, blah all these calls, I guess I, the, I'm, my, I'm saying that we we've. I just want to be clear that, that it's so that we understand I, that I'm we're, not referring to any particular to General Votel, but there have been since the coup regular communications with uh, at the highest levels of the Department of Defense um, with our, our Turkish counterparts I and, and you since yesterday either. since since there the have president been, of Turkey I know there have been some in the in the last 24 hours there have been some in the last 48 hours and that is not unusual because we're talking to them all the time have we have to be to the Turks directly has anybody in this department refuted the claim that General Votel might have been involved. General Votel has refuted that claim publicly. And he has done that in a press release. So has the secretary, have the chairman, or has General Votel directly refuted this to the Turks? Uh, I'm, I, can't answer that. I can't answer that question because I don't know everyone's phone calls uh, today with the Turks. I will I, directly refuted it with them. I, I, will, I will take that question, but I can assure you that uh, uh, that message from General Votel from hopefully from myself from this podium and others within the building uh, any suggestion that General Votel uh, I just I'm, I'm not I don't know the substance of every single phone call we've had today I'll take the question exactly U.S. Central Command. This is he's a four-star general with 30 mm -hmm. plus years. Of, I mean, that's a high-level call that I would think that the Department of Defense would know was going to happen. If some, if whether it was General Votel or someone on his behalf was calling, we have lots of things to talk to the Turks about. You're talking about the leadership in Turkey right now. You know, I mean, you understand. We're not asking for every little phone call yeah. back and forth to you know order food or what. I don't know. Like we're asking about a very specific high-level call. So okay. if it's possible I will, to take I will, that, I will try and get that question answered for you. If you can get the ones about ordering food. That would be. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Just, just to round it out. General is going to go to Turkey on July 31st, right? Uh, uh, I will, I will leave it to the chairman and his staff to, uh, to tell you about his schedule and itinerary. Another way. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Have a nice weekend.